Craig and Ros McKenzie produce wheat. They produce so much, they've attempted to break the world record for the heaviest wheat crop. They came close in 2008 and tried again in 2010. Though they didn't break the record, they're still consistently producing high yielding crops. Craig tells us how that's achieved. This is a cropping farm, an intensive cropping farm, fully irrigated property. There's 200 hectares here, there used to be slightly more, there's but over 300 hectares and part of it went dairy. So we've sort of pulled back into the cropping area uh, to 200 um, hectares and, and just meant that we could be a bit more intensive, a bit more focused on what we're doing and certainly gave us the opportunity to a lot more attention to detail. Predominantly it would be wheat and ryegrass would be the, the mainstays and then a third would be break crops and they'll be anywhere from hybrid pak choy to hybrid carrots and uh, hybrid onions at times. We've grown hemp before, um, faber beans, broad beans, peas, yeah, a whole range of different crops. We're fully irrigated, only it's all three and a half mils per hectare per day application rate, but some RDR water and some bore water. So that gives us enough to fill the holes within the rainfall periods. It's a crop of Wakanui wheat. It's a very long season maturing wheat. We start planting very early and it's suited for us to have a, a long maturity wheat. It's got really good agronomic strength so we don't have to have a lot of input into it. It's been good in the CPT trials, which are the cultivar trials, and it's, and it's good in our, our location, I think. Uh, and with water, it probably adds to its benefits. It's actually a feed wheat, um, and to date we actually haven't marketed this, this variety. Most other things we have on the farm have all been contracted, but this particular crop's not contracted. Um, but whether that ends up in our dairy operation or whether on the market, we're not sure. We've gone with low seeding rates. There's a, the, our yields have come up dramatically since we did that years ago. It's sort of the theory out of the UK, I guess, and, and it works particularly well for us. The plant can tiller very well. You get very strong tillers, very strong stems. Don't need growth regulators necessarily, and we've halved the cost of seeding. We use neutron probes to be able to make sure we know how much water's in the soil, calculate what's going on with local weather data, add that into, the, into a program, and then work out what the plant requires and then we irrigate accordingly. So we're trying to irrigate between the refill point and the fill point, but never re reaching the full point so we can capture all the rainfall events. Yeah, you don't really know until you put it in, I guess, but in, the, in the combine, but if we've got 20% uh, increase in grain size, we've got 20% increase in yield, I guess, haven't we? So. We're always striving to that perfect wheat, and we're always looking to improve. Disease resistance, uh, rusts mutate, so we've got to keep on top of it and get more resistance genes in. And by screening international material and putting them into our own New Zealand bread lines, we're starting to lift the bar. So this cultivar was only a breeding line when it came over. It hasn't been released anywhere else in the world. And we identified it for its yield potential, and since releasing the cultivar in New Zealand, they're actually re-looking at it for the Danish market. The Wakanui has an advantage. Sometimes it can set four to five grains across. Most feed wheats are three to four. So as you can see here, there's five grains across. One, two, three, four, five. And that's really where it gets its yield advantage. Uh, Wakanui is quite a tall wheat, but it has very good straw strength. And as you can see, it, there's no problems with it bouncing back. The winter was... Uh wet for a little bit but not too bad so establishment was good we were able to control that. Springtime was a, it was a good spring, a lot better spring than last year and then we got a lot of rain in October, no irrigation needed and then November and December were dry so we were full on irrigating um, so our team did a really good job um, and then it's just a matter of making sure that the, the last bit was right and January was a bit average ho-hum we thought with, with the weather but as it's turned out probably the solar radiation looks like it's going to be alright. We're just measuring the moisture to make sure that it's one, good for storage, and uh, we've got to be under 14 and a half for storage, um, for a long-term storage. Uh, 15 would be acceptable in some situations, but uh, in New Zealand, 14 and a half is the standard. 15.4. It's about the cultivars, it's about the growing season, um, and they're very broad acre in the US but probably don't actually have the climate quite that we have here for longer grain fill and, and the amount of UV. Sometimes a hole in the ozone layer is a pain, but at times like this it's probably okay. This program was made with funding from New Zealand On Air.